Yeah, let's dig into that Rust one a little bit more. So uh, were you kind of a Rust developer before you started working on Polars, or did you see an opportunity in Rust specifically for tackling this problem? How did you, you know, how did how did this come about? That did, did you notice there was this problem that, okay, the kinds of issues that you described where, you know, Pandas, for example, was based on NumPy, and you're like, oh, for string operations and lists and, you know, we're, it's just, it's not going to be efficient. We're going to have to start from scratch. Did you kind of notice that opportunity? And then you're like, okay, I'm going to need to learn Rust, or you just already knew Rust, and you were like, that's going to give me lots of memory and concurrency advantages relative to doing this in Python or C++. How did that come about? No, it's it wasn't um, it wasn't top down. It wasn't for, from observing pandas and thinking, hey, this could be better. It was actually I was um, jumping on the hype train that Rust was back in the day, uh, a, a little bit later, I, I guess. I think five years ago, um, a friend of mine said, hey look at this Ross, it's very cool. And um, I came from a <laughs> Python data science background and uh, I thought, oh, I don't need that low level of a language. Um, but I always dabbled a bit with functional programming and wanted to learn more languages just for the fun of it. And so I also learned Rust. And in the beginning, I what I did was if I had an algorithm for, for um, some data science, machine learning use cases, I implemented that algorithm in Rust if it was slow in Python. Um, and I found this super powerful because you could implement that algorithm and made a, py a Python binding to it. And you had a very fast, um, you had a very fast library with, um, which you could use in Python in an interactive manner um, with the performance benefits of Rust. Um, and this still didn't give me an ID for a data frame library, but um, when I was getting more mature in Rust and I was implementing a web server for my work back in the day, I needed to join two tables that were on disk. And I thought, let's take the data frame library from the Rust ecosystem, which, was, which didn't exist. So I thought, oh, maybe I can build this join algorithm from scratch. How does that work? How do you write a join algorithm? So I wrote one, finished it, it worked, and I was just curious, how does it perform against Pandas? And it was super slow. So I thought, <laughs> that, that was an unexpected. I, I, I just yeah. thought that was going to end with, no, it no, was no. crazy fast, and you're like, hey, it was terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. Back in that, in that time, I wasn't good in performance programming yet. Um, I didn't know anything um, about hardware optimizations, um, et cetera. But, it gave me a challenge. I thought, okay, let's make this thing faster than Pandas. So I, I made it faster. Um, and then I thought, mm, maybe I can build a, maybe I, I can add more methods and build a data frame library for the Rust ecosystem. Um, and that, that took me another four months, I think, before there was something that I would call sort of a data frame library, the very beginnings of it. And then I, there was a database benchmark back in the day, the database benchmark from R, which was hosted by the R um, data table uh, guys. And I added Polars to the benchmark and it did pretty well. I think we were fourth or so. No, we were, yeah, we were fourth or so after Julia, um, but, but our data table was far ahead, was far ahead. And I, that gave me another goal. How do they do that? <laughs> so put my head down and, um, um, yeah. Um, after a few months or I think, I don't know how many months, but now it's f faster than our data table. We beat them in performance, but it was, um, it was more implementing that stuff because I wanted to learn about it and setting the goals of those performance things. And during the way, I started to learn about how databases work, how query optimizers work. Um, and um, can I elaborate on this? Because it's quite a long story or? Absolutely, okay, man, okay. go for it. Okay. Um, <laughs> as I said, in the beginning, I still wanted to build a data frame in Rust. And when that, got sort of complete, I started to make a Python 
API for it. And I thought, let's take the Pandas Python API and build those methods. And that was a really rough decision because the Pandas API, it's very hard to predict what the output will be. Actually, the output will change depending on the data, which is a rule that isn't allowed in Polars. What, is, what does that mean, that, that it changes based on the data? Like, like the, the, the format will the change automatically? data types yeah, oh, oh. are not known statically. So, uh. And this is a rule that Polars doesn't want to break. So if you have a sort of a schema, you have a schema and you apply a join or you apply some operation, you need to know what the output schema will be. Because that way you as a programmer can predict what will happen um, independent of the data that's that's coming in. There, the only the only um, exception to this rule is when you do data inference. So if you have a CSV file, you need to infer what the data types will be. At that point, you say, okay, this this is based on the data, this inference. But after that, um, we know what the schema is. The operations may lead to another schema, to another data type, but it should be known statically. And statically means before running. Before running the operation, you need to know what the output type will be. And this is important, one, for um, not creating bugs. Not As a user, it's very, very convenient to understand what my output type will be. So if I need to... If I expect an integer uh, and I index into a dictionary, that will keep working. And if it suddenly changes to a float, my my index doesn't make any sense. Or if I index into a list. Um, other than that, it's also very important for an optimizer to know anything. If the optimizer doesn't know what an output type will be and needs the data to determine that, you need to you have a dependency. You can only start optimizing when you have the data and then it's too late. So it's also very important for an optimizer to know the schema. We started to make a Python. I started to make a Python interface and wanted to, uh, wanted to copy the Pandas API. And that was really hard because the output types were unknown, depending on the data. Um, but I still tried it. And at that point, I also started investigating and researching how query optimizers work. And for for query optimizer, you need to know the data type. So I had to come up with a different API and actually add a lazy API uh, to get some, um, get some distance between the API and the execution that should not be mapped one-on-one. -on -one. There should be an intermediate representation in there, an intermediate step so you can you can make the dsl the domain specific language like in python the the, the, the python syntax is a dsl uh, in polar it's a polar query language which is a dsl it should be different um, from execution it should not be tied closely together um, so when i started doing research on on databases um at that point, Polars became much more familiar to people who know Polars as it is now. Because at that point, we started the Expression API. Um, we started with the Lazy API and the unification of those APIs. And it became, at that point, it was also a realization for me, hey, this is super powerful. And I think this is something that, even if it would have the same performance as Pandas, would still be very useful for people because it gives you a lot of versatility. Um, and I think at that point, um, I think that was two and a half years ago, it became a project that, that really had a goal of being something that, that, that takes the Pandas use case.